Genesis 6 narrative states that the Nephilim are on the earth in those days and also afterwards. If that's true, can we find evidence that corroborates this? I'm L.A. Marzulli. Join me as we go on the trail of the Nephilim. There is a hidden history that's been deliberately obfuscated from the peoples of the world, and that's why I am on the trail of the Nephilim. Uh, I'm your host, L.A. Marzulli. Welcome to another episode of On the Trail of the Nephilim. Uh, as always, we try to bring you interesting stories. I think you'll find this one. It's from a fan of the show. His name is Rick, and I'll be reading that. But first, a word from our trusted sponsor. Are you worried about the future of the U.S. economy? With so much uncertainty in the air, it's natural to fret about the security of your retirement savings. But there's one asset that stands the test of time. Folks, that's gold. For centuries, gold has been a hedge against market volatility and economic instability. With a gold IRA from Noble Gold Investments, you can harness the power of precious metals to help protect your financial future. By rolling over your existing IRA or 401k into a self-directed gold IRA, you can enjoy the potential for long-term growth and stability. Diversify your portfolio with a tangible asset that has real value. Setting up your gold IRA has never been easier. Folks, go with Noble Gold Investments' streamlined process and expert guidance. This election year, don't let election volatility and uncertainty keep you up at night. Vote for the timeless safety of gold and silver in 2024. Noble Gold Investments will give you up to 10 one-ounce silver Trump coins or a 10-ounce silver American flag bar if you open a qualified account. Go to noblegoldinvestments.com right now. That's noblegoldinvestments.com. Please check it out, folks. We did a number of years ago. We bought gold. I think it, it was $1,670. It's now up to $2,500 an ounce. So um, I'm really glad we did it. And I would strongly uh, in, in, in encourage you to do it. But like with all investments like this, there is a potential risk. Pray about it. Think about it. But go to noblegoldinvestments.com. That's noblegoldinvestments.com. All right, folks. Thanks for tuning in. This is from Rick. Um, and the subject is giants. Buffalo Bill's account of Pawnee Indians finding giant bones while out on an expedition. An account of finding giants' bones from Buffalo Bill's book, The Life of Honorable William F. Cody, known as Buffalo Bill, the famous hunter scout and guide, an, autobi an, an autobiography, sorry about that, pages 267, 268. While we were in the Sand Hills scouting in the Neobrara County, the Pawnee Indians brought into camp one night some very large bones, one of which a surgeon of the expedition pronounced to be the thigh bone of a human being. Let me stop right there. When you look at a thigh bone, that's called the femur. You can ascertain the height of the person from the length of the femur. So a normal human femur, 18, 22 inches, somewhere in that, you start getting femurs that are 30 inches, now you're looking at a giant. I'll give you an idea. And I've, I've been in museums, uh, in, in the back rooms where uh, the bones of First Nation people were still being held. They were in the process of being repatriated, and they should be at somebody's uncle or father or grandfather. There's no way those bones should be uh, in a museum. And that's why the whole—I I agree with NAGPRA in part. Native American Grave Protection Repatriation Act, it makes a lot of sense on one level. On the other hand, if these are not Native Americans, then the public has a right to look at them. If there were giants roaming the land, then, you know, B Bill Cody's making this up to sell books— it's only like a, a it's 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 only not even a page. So let's get into it. The Indians claim that the bones they had found were those of a person belonging to a race of people who a long time ago lived in this country. Stop right there. How many times have we heard this from other tribes? So we have the Native American First Nation oral tradition, which tells us, in the, in the words of Sarah Winnemucca, Paiute Native American First Nation person, that the giants, the Sitika, were there. I mean, how many times do we have to hear this? 
you know, all these Native Americans are just making stuff up? I, I think not. I think not. Something is going on. There is a hidden history. But I digress. Okay. Uh, the Indians claim that the bones they had found were those of a person belonging to a race of people who a long time ago lived in this country. That there was once a race of men on the earth whose size was about three times that of an ordinary man. Fifteen feet tall? How tall was Goliath? Let me stop right there. Some people, with all due respect, certain scholars say, well, Goliath wasn't really a giant. He was only about seven feet tall. I don't believe that. Goliath was a Nephilim, as were Goliath's brothers. That's why David picks up the other stones, not only for Goliath, but Goliath's brothers. I got that from Chuck Missler. But um, it's true. They were here. And the giants, just think of just Og of Bashan. Look how, look how tall he might have been. 11, 12, 13 feet. Look at his bed stand. We're not making this stuff up. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. And there are many different tribes, in my opinion, of the Nephilim, the Nephilim, the Zanzumim, the Emims, the Anakim, the Rephaim. And this, of course, is where it gets into the elongated skulls. So is this genetic? Some people will say, oh, it's not genetic. This is the result of cranial deformation. This is why our film on the DNA evidence, and remember, we took 58 samples from nine, nine from the uh, Ica Museum, nine from a private museum in Paracas. And I look, we had an optometrist look at these. The orbits are about 25% larger than a normal human beings. But here's the kicker, and I've talked about this before. The foramen magnum, which is the, which is the connecting point of the spinal column to the base of the skull, is all the way to the occipital plate. You can't do that. You can't bind the head of a child and move the foramen magnum. The foramen magnum should be in the center, right here, of the skull. That way it would balance the head. It's not. Could these be the anakim? The anakim translates long necks. We're not saying it is, but we do know this from, from our work uh, on the DNA. And, you know, there is always naysayers that will say things like we don't know what we're talking about. And that's why in our film on DNA we've got doctors, surgeons, anthropologists, archaeologists, chiropractors, optometrists. It's a multidiscipline team. They're all looking at it and saying, this is genetic. And it goes back to the Genesis 315 seed war. The seed of the dragon will be at war at enmity with the seed of the woman. The one coming from the woman will crush the dragon's head. So there's a lot of naysayers out there. Not a lot, but there's a few that will say we don't know what we're talking about. Watch the DNA film and then weigh in. Or go down to Paracas yourself and get 58 samples and then sequence them. Our sequencing showed that there was a preponderance of connectivity to the Middle East and Eastern Europe. So immediately they go, oh, it's contaminated. It's not contaminated. Watch the film. Our protocols were incredible. We had full-blown lab suits on, full-blown lab suits. Heads are covered, eyeglasses on, double sleeves, gloves, a lab suit. And then when Mondo Gonzalez and I were, were finished taking a sample, uh, that sample was in, a, in, a, in a, a piece of paper like this, the powder folded like this right into a, um, uh, a glass vial or a plastic vial, sealed and tagged. That's it. That, that's how we did it. It's all in the film. Richard Shaw was our, uh, our videographer, our director, of course, and then Chase Klotsky tagged and bagged everything. And Mondo and I did roughly 58 samples. So there you go. So the naysayers will go, it's all contaminated. Well, if it was contaminated, why didn't we get nuclear DNA? We didn't get nuclear DNA. Folks, there is a hidden history. Let's continue with the article. Um, so they were... They were about three times the size of an ordinary man. They were so swift and powerful that they could run alongside of a buffalo. And taking the animal in one arm could tear off a leg and eat the meat as they walk. These giants denied the existence of a great spirit. And when they heard the thunder or saw the lightning, they laughed at it and said that they were greater than either. This so displeased the great spirit that he caused a great rainstorm to come. And the water kept rising higher and higher so that it drove those proud and conceited giants from the low grounds to the hills and thence to the mountains. But at last, even the mountaintops were submerged, and then those mammoth men were all drowned. After the flood had subsided, the great spirit came to the conclusion that he had made man too large and powerful, and that he would therefore correct the mistake by creating a race of men of smaller size and less strength. This is the reason 
reason, say the Indians, that modern men are small and not like the giants of old. And they claim that the story is a matter of oral tradition, Indian history, which has been handed down among them from time immemorial. Uh, immemorial. As we had no wagons with it at the time, this large and heavy bone was found. We were obliged to leave it. Anyway, folks, do with that what you will. Um, there's too much oral tradition. We hear it over and over and over again. So, you know, w- what is the truth? If there are giants in the land, then why, and we have stories like this, then, and <laughs> why, why the pushback? Why the pushback? So even the flood legend that we have in our Bible um, has been handed down orally to First Nation people. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards, when the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful and and went into them. Uh, They had sex with them. It's a mingling of the seed. Folks, Genesis 3.15 is the gateway to our Bibles. Come to an understanding of that, and the rest of the Bible opens up. Do not have the proper exegesis of Genesis 3.15, and a person is left wondering what we're looking at. If you were going to keep one scripture from the people and one paradigm from the people so that they would never really understand what is going on supernaturally, that's what you keep out. And that's what they've done. They've created the Sethite theory, which basically says that the godly line of Seth saw the Hoochie Mamas of Cain, and they created this offspring, and it was no good. But that's not what the text said. The sons of God, the B'nai Elohim, always refers back to the angels of heaven. And it hails back to Genesis 3.15. Hats off to Gary Stearman, who lectured us all at the Nephilim Mounds Conference years ago. Russ Dizdar, Chief Joseph River, Winfred Zimmerman, and I all went to school. Gary uh, elucidated that passage, Genesis 3.15. I have since come to call it the gateway to the biblical narrative. If we don't understand the seed war, we don't understand anything, especially when we get to passages like Daniel 2.43. Their seed will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not cleave to them. Think about that. Thanks so much for watching, folks. We've got the sale, the pre-sale on the book. Wrongs of Disclosure, we're very pleased to announce that we partnered up with Charisma Magazine, also Leadership Books, where I just completed a um, 15-part course. Um, It's a teaching video. There's 15 parts to it, plus there's a study guide that will go with it. That hopefully will be out sometime when the book comes out. So more about that in the days to come. Thanks so much for watching. Click the subscribe button, and we'll see you back here again with another episode. Hey folks, Elian Marzulli here. I've got book number 14 coming out. It's being published by Charisma Media. It's called Rungs of Disclosure. Let me whet your appetite. What is it, 77 years ago, something happened in Roswell, New Mexico? Was it really a weather balloon, or was it something else? Folks, one of the very first chapters in that book delves into the whole Roswell event. What I think happened there was a cover-up, and it began the deliberate obfuscation that continued until 2017. And Tucker Carlson asked Commander David Fravor, in your opinion, what was this tic-tac-shaped UFO that you saw? Commander David Fravor looks right at the camera and says, whatever this was, was not from this earth. That's the nexus. That's the beginning of the Rungs of Disclosure book. I think it's the most important book I've ever penned. Go to lamarzuli.com, lamarzuli.com. You can pre-order the book, save five bucks, and that book will be autographed by yours truly. Don't forget, folks, UFOs are real, burgeoning, and not going away. In my opinion, this is the coming great deception that Jesus warns us about.